Welcome to Shafi Live. My name is Bailo Jalo and with my colleague Chiwe Chihana. Good evening, Chiwe. Good evening, Bailo. And this is exciting. Audiences, welcome to our very first live broadcast on Sheffield Live TV tonight. And we've got a special guest. Our show is amazing tonight. We'll be speaking to one of our own from right here in Sheffield. Election fever is hitting each and every one of us already. So our guest tonight is an aspiring candidate for Sheffield Central MP under the Labour Party. His name is Abdi Suleiman. Good evening, Abdi. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Abdi, I I can't even remember how long ago that was, but many years ago when I used to work for the Northern Refugee Centre, I met you at the University of Sheffield and you were the student union president. What on earth has happened to get you back to where you are today in Sheffield and aspiring to be MP for Sheffield Central? No, thank you. Um, so after, well, actually the first thing I did after being at the Student Union is I went back to university to finish my, um, my degree in philosophy because I was actually a sabbatical uh, student. So I, I took that break, um, finished off, got my head back into uh, philosophy. Um, and then after that, one of the campaigns we'd started at the university was around international students. Right. around making sure they feel welcome, mm -hmm. around making sure the government had the right policy on international students, making sure that, uh, that, that, that all of the media that was putting out really like quite vicious stuff about international students mm -hmm. uh, was actually being counteracted by positive stories. Stories of other students who were saying, well, well actually I want to protect other international students and, I want to, I, and as part of that I want to recognise myself as an international student. Yeah. So we had this campaign called We Are All International, or We Are International, it became in the end, and we, I came back to the university, you know, I, I started working on that. So we wow. started campaigning um, and actually trying to make, trying to change policy and other things like that. So that was that was kind of where I went. And then from there, I went from place to place, learning about policy, almost like a student of policy, going from place yeah. to place, campaigns, and actually just various ways of trying to do what I felt at the time was the right thing in lots of different contexts. So that's kind of, <laughs> kind of and, and that's how I end up here. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Do you know one thing that I that, that has stood out from what you were saying about your student days, and I'm yeah. sure we're going to get into your adult life, if you will, um, is. <laughs> At African Voices Platform, one of the biggest things is you have to strike that balance between always constantly countering the narrative that mainstream uh, society uh, places upon our identities. Mm. And how did you find that experience as a student? That must have been a burden, though, in a way. But also, it was good to influence policy, I suppose. It, it's an int it's an interesting question <coughs> because you're you know, um, you know, you, Sheffield has a large Somali community. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, at the same time, sometimes, at least, especially, I mean, it was a while back, but when I was at university, you didn't see as many Somalis on campus. So when you did, you kind of got quite excited. Like, mm. it was like a big, it was like a big deal. It was like, oh, wow, yeah. like, amazing. Like, but the, it kind of made you think, wait a minute, that isn't normal. Like, this city is full of incredibly talented, intelligent people. What's going on? There's, there must be something wrong with the system and to make sure that that many really talented people are not going to the university mm. in their own city. And so actually, that's what I, funny enough, that's one of the things that made me think I really want to get into outreach because I feel yeah. like I want to find out where does the problem lie and I really want to find out if it's something that we can work on and we can kind of fix. And I think it's interesting as well because, you know, when you have incredible amounts of negative mm. press uh, around uh, people from Africa, people from Somalia, what you, what you, you know, people from Somalia as well, what you kind of get is you get like a real... You get that you get that really unfortunate thing where people were looking. Oh wow, well, you know this is this is really amazing. I, I I didn't expect this, and you're like, no, you, no, I no, shouldn't no. be exceptional. No, 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 no that's not that's not that's, <laughs> not, that's not This should be normal. We should yeah. we shouldn't be talking about this being exceptional. This is absolutely yeah. normal because actually we all know that there are incredibly like talented, intelligent, funny, brilliant people mm -hmm. that just haven't had the right circumstances and things haven't matched up in exactly the right way. And that's partly, I mean. I don't know if I'm almost getting on to talking about politics. That's where I think politics that's where comes you in. Come, uh, I think that's where politics yeah. comes in. No, that's, all, that's okay that you touched on that because there's something else you touched on that could lead into that yes. and I hope it leads into it later. Okay. But you touched on Somali, your Somali heritage. Yeah. Now, I want to understand the why. The why, obviously, you're saying Somali and you looked around you, you grew up around the Somali community that is here, that is British, yeah. and you didn't see them in university. But So why are you? Who are you? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, the, the, I mean, the, worst, the worst Somalis at university, it's just that 
compared to how many brilliant people I knew who were somebody, mm-hmm. it just I just felt like the numbers were disproportionate. Like I felt like there were so many more people who should be in those spaces and that should be in positions of uh, of leadership in those spaces. Yeah. And I think I, you know I was born in Somalia. Okay. I w- left there because of the civil war. I came to Sheffield. Sheffield was, you know, it was. Sheffield actually was the first place to declare itself a city of sanctuary. Yeah. Right. And I think the declaration as a city of sanctuary almost comes much later because actually well before that it already was a city of sanctuary. Yeah. And it was a place that was incredibly welcoming, making it really easy for people to come, really easy for people to, um, to, 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 to settle and engage and meet lots of people who were incredibly willing to help them. Not, not every story is perfect. Like lots of people had difficult stories when they're coming and it was definitely more difficult in the, in the earlier days. But I feel like that sense of responsibility that lots of people in Sheffield take to making sure that it is a welcoming place yeah. is something that allows you to be comfortable and to flourish in your identity, right? So you don't have to be embarrassed about any kind of identity. Actually, there's no reason to be embarrassed, right? There's, there's yeah. no reason to be incredibly proud of identity. But a place like Sheffield gives you the space to feel like that's completely okay. Mm. So, so speaking of that, yeah. early years, how did, how did you find it? And how, did you, how were you able to blend that Somali heritage and now coming into a new city? knew of everything looking at coming from Somalia mm. it's totally different to Sheffield and the atmosphere the culture yeah. so how did you able to blend that into who you are today do you know I, I I always think it's one of those things where we should have a lot of gratitude for our elders because I was a kid so mm-hmm. as a child you know I learned Somali and then I learned English at nursery right so yeah. it was kind of like you know everything was you know when you're a child everything is normal right if you if you if you if you put a child in the middle of the sea the child thinks the sea is kind of normal as well right so you just kind of grow and you adapt but i think for the elders who came here that must have been a real culture shock and that must have been so mm. incredibly difficult for them right you know can you imagine not even being able to you know know if the if the milk you're buying is the right one not even being able to know what the products are that you're getting right yeah i can only imagine how many times my mum and other other people who came to the the country at the time will have come back with the wrong thing from the shop, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and and and, they, and there's so many of these stories. I've heard stories of people buying completely the wrong item because they're just picking things off the desk and they're trying to work out what it is, right? Yeah. And I think that they the struggle that they went through is the reason that we have the the, the, the ease a much more comfortable position. Uh, and I'm much more able to, to, to look around and go, actually, not only am I interested in opportunities, but actually, I, we should take positions of leadership. We should be willing to say that, you know, we're here, this is our country, and actually, we're going to we're going to play a part in what it looks like in the future. Definitely, and, definitely. You know, and, and you've come a long way in terms of politics, starting from university, you were kind of like the president of Sheffield Hallam Student Union, and now you're aspiring to be the first black African male um, to represent Sheffield in Westminster. So how did you get into politics? Why politics? Because when you see those injustices, when you see things that just aren't right, and it can happen in any context, right? Yeah. Usually the answer lies somewhere in politics, why things are, you know, messed up in the way they are, right? Because politics in a way is often trying to ask who, go, who gets what, when, where, how, and so on, right? Mm. Politics is often the discussion between a society about what goes where, right? And too often you see the resource, the opportunities, right? Going to the rich and to the powerful and being hoarded. And there's no, there's no reason to allow that kind of hoarding, right? Mm. Because if there's so many people that need those opportunities, that need those resources in order to find fulfillment in their lives, right? Yeah. Then it's ridiculous and unforgivable, right? for someone to order. There's, a, there's, a, there's an old American politician who used to make this point, right? He used to say, yeah, listen, like, you know, he used to say to the, to, to the multi-billionaires, take what you want from the table, eat as much as you can, drink as much as you can, have you the biggest house you want, do whatever you want. Have fun. Mm-hmm. But when you're, t- bring back the rest. <laughs> yeah. Because there's no way you could have used all of that for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's an interesting, like, way of thinking about it, that the hoarding of resource, the hoarding of things away from the rest of society is one of the most damaging things. So, so yeah. yeah. So when I, when I saw those injustices, for me, the answer lies in politics. Yeah. What, what do you think feeds that extravagance, though? Is it is it just power play? What is it exactly? I, I, I almost wonder because you'd think that 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 would be the normal thing. You're you're living on the street, or you've got these multi-million, multi-billion pounds sitting mm. doing nothing, mm. and you're walking on a street where somebody is lying down by your mm. by your pavement, for example, mm. and. and they literally have no home to go to. Mm. So what, what, what feeds into that? 
the, I think there's a number of things. Um, one of them is if something like you know Thatcher's statement, there is no such thing as society. If that statement, if that statement gets far enough, right? If enough people begin to believe there's no such thing as society, yeah. if they begin to believe they have no responsibility for anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's incredibly easy to walk past that person. It's incredibly easy to to hoard wealth and power and everything else if you feel like you have no responsibility to anybody else. Yeah. But if you feel connected, if you feel like there's a community, if you feel, feel a sense of responsibility, then it's impossible, right? You know how easy it is to walk past your, you know, they do this, they do these. Um, I've seen one of these social experiments where they get someone's like brother or wife to pretend to be, you know, to, to, to be to be um, to be homeless, and people still walk past them, right? Mm. Because they, for them, it's like they they block it out, right? But later on, when they told that was your brother, right? They're like, oh, they're so shocked, right? But it says something about how we how we how we're kind of uh, uh, the, the way that we've ended up um, treating people who are, who are less often. All of us are kind of like being fed into this culture, right? Yeah. That we're able to walk past. Now, I think the answer doesn't lie at the personal level alone. Right. Mm. I think that it's if there is homelessness, exactly, if there is homelessness, the problem, you know, charity can solve the solution once, twice, three times. Right. But the point is to have a systematic approach. That means that there is no homelessness at all. Right. Absolutely. If you see if you see poverty, you can fix it once, twice, three times through charity. But okay. at some point you have to ask the systematic question, which is where you build something like a welfare state or something else. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, for me, this is a, a big deal is that how do you make sure there are systematic ways of dealing mm. with injustices, uh, and, and, and it's it's a uh, it's it's you know it's a question we should all be uh, you know kind of focused on asking ourselves. Sorry. True, I totally agree with you there. But in terms of um, what you're talking about, yeah. you know, politics when you are not into it yeah. is one thing. Yeah. When you get into it, yeah, is another thing. Yeah. How prepared are you in terms of getting into politics? Do you know it's it's interesting because you know it's a it's a very good question because I think. You're almost asking two questions. One is politics as the ideal and politics as the reality. Yeah. Because politics as the ideal is this yeah. idea that there is, you know, there's a democracy, you know, everybody has an equal chance of getting involved, mm. you know, everyone has an equal chance of being able to have power and to decide the things that affect their life. Politics as the reality is that politics itself is sometimes skewed, right? Yeah. Politics itself sometimes has injustices built into it. Policy itself is sometimes a place where the first couple of people who try to do something will stumble, will find it difficult, mm -hmm. will find it bureaucratic, they'll find multiple ways of frustra being frustrated. But eventually when you break through mm -hmm. and enough people start breaking through, mm -hmm. something that used to be extraordinary becomes normal, right? Yeah. And I think that's kind of, you know, uh, how prepared am I? I mean, I, 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 feel like I, I feel like I've been involved in multiple types of politics to understand it. But uh, you know, if, if there's if there's you know if there's one you know you can make criticism. That sometimes I am a bit ideal. Sometimes I do believe that you know that that, that things are meant to happen. You know that 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 the, the ideas will become real, right? Mm -hmm. So I tend to you know if people you know I believe that if I believe that there should be a system in which people should be allowed to have maximum amounts of control over the things that affect their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that it will happen, it will happen. You know, it just, you just need as many, you need, you need a, 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 an overwhelming number of good people, right? right? And sometimes the political system is way too brutal for that, right? It doesn't wait for that. So it's, uh, it's, yeah. so it's a process. It's a process, it's a process. I mean, the truth is we are political beings, even yeah. when we don't recognize that we are political beings, we mm. are political, we yeah. exist in political systems, mm. everything we do, what we eat today is yeah. politics, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and when in ta so our mess as humanity is, is a crisis of entanglements of, of different mm. systems that are, that, that are just, you know, um, doing injustice to, to, to so many people. Mm. Um, you have stepped into this path now and so Abdi is going to become a politician but what you've been doing as well I've picked up is that you've been working in political affairs as well in the last, what, yeah. what's that about what have you been doing what does that mm. mean uh, political affairs in this context means that um, there will be people who are also trying to navigate the political system mm -hmm. and that they in a way will almost ask you to be a guide and to support them in that and I guess for me, the principle is that we do it only for good people, right? For mm -hmm. people that are usually shut out of the political system, right? People who usually find it incredibly difficult mm -hmm. to access power or to understand how the system works. Right. And so political, in a way, I work in, in parliamentary affairs. Parliament can be such a confusing and convoluted place, right? It can be a place that is can be quite hostile. If you okay, so, so, so let, let, let's bring it down a notch. Okay, sorry. Okay, let's yeah, bring yeah. it down a notch. I, so, so people in Sheffield Central yes. do not know what you've been doing when you say you're working in parliamentary. Who have yeah. you been working for? 
Uh, so for I, I, my my own kind of agency, um, so that's the first thing. As okay. a small team was, um, it's. I mean, the reason I'm, you know, there will be there will be people come to us asking us to support them with their kind of campaigns, and what we'll do. So for example, some of the stuff that I have referenced that we've done is stuff like the National Team Borders Bill, right? Because right. I can't talk about everything other, but some yeah. of the things like the National Team Borders Bill. An awful piece of legislation, right? Mm -hmm. An incredibly racist piece of legislation. Topical right? still, yeah. Very topical still, right? Mm -hmm. Especially now that uh, you know Suella Reverend is talking about daydreaming about watching flights. I just, I just want you to be careful there mm -hmm. when you say a racist bill. Um, the government is not here to defend themselves, so okay. Okay. you know okay. I don't okay. want us to go into that angle. Oh, okay, okay, I won't. Say, I, 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 I will say that it is a bill written specifically to make life incredibly difficult mm -hmm. for people who have come asking for help right <laughs> i'll say that much right yeah. uh -huh. whether 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 or not you whether or not after a while it feels like a lot of the people that are being treated like that come from certain types of backgrounds it, it is one thing but it is definitely a bill written to be difficult to make it incredible. To make it difficult for people, I agree. But exactly. not to make it difficult just for ordinary uh, colored people. But because if you look at it, it does affect other people as well who are from the majority, like other white people. Yes, but um, you know, like I said, I just want us to deviate okay. that angle because they are not here to defend themselves. The one thing I will add though, is that in the National Team Borders Bill, one of the things the government introduced was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. was a provision that allowed them to strip citizenship uh, from individuals based on the, their capacity to have another citizenship, right? Which means, strictly speaking, that gives them the power. I mean, I'm British, but theoretically, mm -hmm. there are they could they could you know the Home Secretary could develop grounds to strip me of citizenship. Yeah. But it gets even further. If you're say I don't know Irish, and Ireland can offer you a citizenship for having an Irish grandparent, suddenly Irish people can be stripped of citizenship. So there is definitely like it's not entirely about you know race, mm -hmm. but it's definitely about this idea that suddenly you've created a second tier of citizen yeah you know the the britain that That's was vulnerable exactly it can the, be taken away exactly the, yeah. the britain that was telling the story mm -hmm. that everyone you know once you're british you're british that's it you're equal okay. right and, and 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 you have an equal uh chance of partaking in society suddenly the government introduces a bill that allows you to strip away some of that Equality and it's and, and, and that's the sad thing is that it passed. I give them extra powers and it passed. Yeah, right? I, I mean, I, and I suppose you know you're you're always a sitting duck. You're you're vulnerable at every juncture. Uh, what you had as security before yeah. is you know you, you you constantly have this thing hanging over your head. So I understand yeah. that. So what specifically did you do around the nationality bill? So the nationality there was a, there was a coalition of us that came together. Right. Um, various different organisations. Um, and really what we did is we, some of us focused on the lobbying mm. of parliament, uh, some of us focused on protests, mm -hmm. some of us focused on letter writing and MPs and things like that. So it was really a multifaceted campaign that was on, on different layers. Sensitization, really, awareness and challenging. Exactly. Yes, at, yeah. at, at every different layer, trying to influence, trying to get, because this is the thing about politics, is uh, there's a bit in my video where I talk about, I, I, I'm just tired of asking the wrong people to do the right thing. And that's because often, especially now with this government, mm -hmm. you're asking a conservative majority government to care, right, mm -hmm. about poor people, about working class people, about people from migrant backgrounds, right? right? And the Conservative Party has proven again and again that it just doesn't care. And this is you right. speaking here today yeah. as an aspiring candidate yes. for Sheffield Central yeah. under the Labour Party, yeah. and you're saying the first city of sanctuary, yeah. there's the whole lot of the nationality bill, yeah. and what are you bringing to the table now? Not we have it, it's there. So yeah. what, what would you want to aspire for the candidacy here in relation to the bill? In relation to the bill, I would, so I think, I think the way things are heading right now, mm -hmm. we're likely to have a Labour government. Mm -hmm. And I actually think what a Labour government is able to do is, to able, to do, is able to do something mm -hmm. that is fantastic for all of us, which is actually to get rid of the citizen deprivation powers yeah, all the way back to the eighties, right? Because actually, this was this was just the latest layer that was added to it, the latest extra power, and this happens all the time. There's a little bit of legislation that's introduced, everyone is made to kind of normalize it, then another piece is added, another piece is added, and before you know it, your what you were told was going to be, oh, this is just you know we just need it for specific situations, suddenly becomes a broad rule twenty thirty years down the line. Right. And I think actually what a Labour government will be able to do is to dismantle the entire citizen deprivation system, right? 
so that no one in this country has to live as a second tier, uh, second class citizen. Mm. So that's something that we can do, and that's something that I would love to do as a Labour MP to put to advocate for. Right. So let's talk about the constituency that yes. you are aspiring to be yeah. an MP for, which yeah. is Sheffield Central. Um, you mentioned on your campaign video you grew up in Broom Hall. Yeah. You've got that connection, but also um, Sheffield Central has got a very young population like yourself, mm. you know, so many students and that kind of thing. But most of them as well or sometimes are kind of like disconnected with politics. Yeah. Mm. How are you going to make sure you bring those young people mm. into politics so that they understand what you are aspiring for? Mm. It's a very, very good question. And I think the, you, the best way is a bit like what you were just, a uh, bit like the question you were just asking me. You have to succeed in something, right? Mm -hmm. If you go after something like the National Team Borders Bill and you're able to get rid of it, you're able to turn around to lots of young people who say, because the main argument that people make is not that they don't understand that politics might matter, is that they don't feel like there's anything that can be done through it, yeah. right? And so you think they feel like there's no, no point wasting time? Exactly. Like if all you ever come back with is losses, right? If every time anyone tries to win something, it doesn't work, right? In the end, it, becomes, it, becomes, it actually makes people uh, demoralized, right? So the way you get lots of young people energized is mm -hmm. by winning. And you win small, then you win a little bit bigger, and then you win very big, right? And you keep going like that. And, and, and I tell you, some of the young people in Broom Hall, some of the young people in Shower, some of the young people in Leather, some of the young people in Sheffield Central, mm. they're energetic, they're enthusiastic, they're talented, right? Mm. And they know a lot more, like, you know, because of the access they have to TikTok, to Instagram, you know, to, to like really quick bits of politics. Mm. Some of them are so much sharper when it comes to politics than any of us were at their age. They're so, like, some of them really, really get it. Right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. But they, but but the question, the bit that's not connecting, is how does their understanding of politics connect with the political system, right? And the political system is often, you know, has its rules, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to run for a candidate like this. You've got to do this. You've got to do this, right? It almost so, functions in a silo in relation to lived experience it can, it and can, everyday life. Absolutely. Yeah. It can sometimes feel like it can sometimes feel like. So one of the things I'm trying to do is almost bridge that gap, mm -hmm. right? right? That actually, if you if you can break through and say, okay. For me, this was complicated and convoluted trying to get through the system. Mm -hmm. But once one, two, three, you know, once a few people do it, actually, now we, we have proof that it can work. And you know what? Someone even better, even more talented, even more capable mm -hmm. is the one that we're preparing it for. Right? And that's always the point. It's that, it's that idea that, you know, you, you, you plant a tree for in whose shade you don't expect to, um, uh, you know, ever, ever sit. Ever sit, yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, we don't know who those people are, right? We don't know them by name. Some of them, I think, well, maybe I know them, but you know, yeah. but there are some incredibly, incredibly, incredibly capable people. Yeah. And actually, that's one thing I hope. I hope. I hope that later on in this campaign, um, that when it becomes much, you know, when it, you know, at the moment, it's it's, it's this a, is the nascent. It's the quieter stage of the yeah, campaign. Yeah. But in the more active stage of the campaign, I think there's lots of young people who'd be amazing to get their first experience. Because I got my first experience of like door knocking and getting involved in this kind of like like the, you know the very traditional form of politics in the 2010 election, right? right. And, and actually, that's a learning experience. You've got to go through these learning experiences uh, and learn different types of politics and kind of merge them, bring them together. Mm. Yeah. There's a growth. I mean, there's a, there's a growth in, 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 um, in conversations at the yeah. moment around uh, candidates yeah. that are mushrooming here and there within uh, the Sheffield, for Sheffield Central. I mean, that seat was held by Paul Blumfield, a Labour Party guy, for, for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, what what's going to set you apart? What do you think? So, I, I think. By the way, I think you know you, you also have to show respect to people who've done you know the job mm -hmm. you know before. So I think Paul has done a great job. There's, there's a whole bunch of things you can look at. Actually, international students is one of them. He's got a majority of over twenty seven thousand. Majority of twenty seven thousand, and actually on very specific things like international students on on, on on some things, he's he's done an incredible. He's made a massive yeah. contribution, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And because you know he uses his style of doing politics to be able to you know, to be able to make those wins for Sheffield. And I think every person comes with a different style of politics, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, I guess my style of politics would be much more, um, it would be really about seeing, okay, how much energy can we bring to it? How many young people can we get involved in it? Because Sheffield is the constituency, Sheffield Central is the constituency with the most students in the country, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Now, that tells you... I keep forgetting that. That's an important that's thing. That's an important thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a very important thing. <laughs> so it raises two things, which is, if you don't satisfy students, right, that 27,000 is there because part of that story is that those students are satisfied, 
right? Mm. But you have to make sure that young people, like dudes, and young people, one thing I love about like young people is that they will make demands, right? Mm. They make much, they are much more willing to give idealistic demands. They, right now, if you talk to young people, the biggest issue most of them will talk to you about is climate change. And they want to know what you're going to do about it. Mm-hmm. And they want to know, they want to know that your priority is saving the planet. Right. And they have a special interest in that because that is their planet, you know? It, it is their future. It, it is their future, it, yeah, right? It is, it is all our future and we're yeah. really in a crisis at the moment. 100%. You, you, you talk about the, the, the climate and ecological crisis and that uh, reminds me again, just, yeah. just going to touch a little bit into uh, your Somali heritage. Yeah. Uh, that region, uh, the Horn of Africa region, has experienced four seasons yeah. of drought. Yeah. And it's getting to a point where we're now saying it's a crisis. Any thoughts on that? It, it's an it's an absolute catastrophe. And 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 do you know the saddest thing about it all mm. is that the resource to prevent something like that mm. is there in the world, right? Yeah. The ability to make sure that countries like Somalia, like Somalia, like other countries around uh, around Africa, around the world, are prepared for droughts, for floods. The, the, these things are there, right? Mm-hmm. But the question is again, it's about distribution, right? Mm. Are those resources get going there? Uh, is the pre-planning being done, right? Is mm. the preparation being done, mm. right? And unfortunately, the truth is, if if the leadership, if 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 your if your global political leaders yeah. are not interested, right, mm. then you have a serious problem because. And do you think that's the case right now? I th- I think I think. I mean, I'm not going to be super duper unfair. They're not interested at all, right? But I am going to say that. One of the problems that comes from them only thinking about national interests. National interests are important. But you can't with the climate. <laughs> exactly. You? If yeah. you only think in terms of national Borders, interests, it, doesn't it work. puts you in a silo, mm. right? And it puts you in a silo at a time when the thing you need are international interests, cooperative interests, right? And you might say, well, okay, you know, why shouldn't, you know, why should it be the problem of this country to deal with people starving in this country or people uh, mm-hmm. being, fl- being flooded in this country? I'm sorry, but if your political conception of the world mm-hmm. doesn't allow you to see incredible amounts of suffering and to want to commit resources and support to it, right, then I don't think policy is the right place, right? And it's actually dangerous having someone who doesn't care about the interests of other human beings in those kind of positions, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's actually quite dangerous for us. Um, but yeah, so, so that's kind of, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask one controversial question in relation to that. Why the Labour Party and not the Green Party? Because I think mm. as, as generations are coming up and being more aware, they, yeah. they, they understand more about how entangled yeah. the climate and ecological crisis is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not in isolated po- pockets. Mm. And the, the, the kind of party that would have pursued that agenda that mm. we're now st- sort of coming to light to mm. is the Green Party. I just wondered why the Labour Party, because I think your generation mm. seems to understand better that all these politics, yeah. whatever, it's all entangled. One of them, I think, I mean, this is a, a mm-hmm. personal thing. One of them, I think, is, for me, the the history of the Labour Party is something that I find incredibly inspiring. I, I, you know, In the end, I think all of us find ourselves in a tradition of some form. Yeah. And I think the idea that the Labour Party, you know, the idea that once upon a time the British political system was... You know the Conservative Party and the Liberals, not even the Liberal Democrats, the Liberals, right? Mm. And these two parties, in a way, were you know different types of aristocrats, right? Slightly nicer ones, Political slightly aristocrats. Cru- aristocrats exactly. Right? Some of them were slightly nicer aristocrats, some of them were slightly cooler <laughs> aristocrats. Yeah. But they used to have these debates and discussions, and some of them, you know, occasionally could make a really good decision, mm. and the other ones might make a bad. And that was kind of the struggle, right? Mm. And in a way, if you were if you were a working person, you had to make a decision, you know, which you know who, who, who you know which aristocrat are you going to pick this time? And I just love the idea that at some point, you know, the consciousness came amongst working people. Well, wait a minute, what if we did it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What if we actually took power? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. What if we actually built our own party? I mean, if the political system is about votes, mm-hmm. well, surely there's more votes in us, the people in the factory, than, um, than, 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 than um, us, mm-hmm. the people in the factory, yeah. than in... Um, than us, uh, there's, 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 more, there's more people mm-hmm. in us in the factory than there are in, uh, in, in, in the aristocracy. Yeah, yeah. 
I think that's an inspiring idea. So, like, there's power in numbers. Why aren't we taking advantage of Why those numbers of the people who actually need? And I, and I just love the idea that at that point you ended up with dockers and railway workers and right. miners and just factory workers deciding that they were going to pick who was in power, right? Mm. And that they were going to pick a government of their own. And you saw what happened in 1945, right? Yeah. When, when, when ordinary day-to-day people build a government of their own, they build something like the NHS that lasts to this day. Did, did you actually, you know what? That's a very good. So today's t- today as we are speaking, yeah. we've had a change in chancellor. Yeah, uh, we recently had a change in uh, uh, prime minister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. we've had quite a few changes in prime yeah. minister, but the rest of us have had nothing to do with getting yeah. those people in. So, are you really saying that this is this is working? Is it a functional system? Oh, by the way, the, 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 I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue that the British <laughs> political system is well set up, right? Like I can I can I can sit here all day and critique with you, like mm-hmm. in detail. I mean, I can you know. There's multiple ways in the British political system doesn't work. I think the one thing I want to highlight is the way the Labour Party just came out of nowhere and smashed that duopoly between the Liberals and 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 the Conservatives, right? Right. And created a genuinely, you know, a party of people, a party of normal people mm-hmm. who ended up creating the welfare state, creating the NHS things we get to enjoy today. The truth is, today we live in a political system where really there's two parties, right? Mm. Like that have a real chance of governing. Except right? if you live in Sheffield and it's local. We've got oh, local party, local party. <laughs> absolutely. Not. I meant at the national level. <laughs> to pick up on that. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean at the national level. Uh, yeah. At the national level, you're dealing with two parties that, by and large, have like. Especially in the area where you live, you know. Uh, oh yeah, Broomhall. Absolutely, no. That, <laughs> No, the, the, lo- the local though, picture, yeah. the local picture is different. The local picture is different. But at the national level, you are dealing with a situation where you have these two parties, and I guess it comes back to comes back to the question you asked me at the beginning, which is, you know, why labour? Why labour not agreed? Yeah, why labour? Yeah, given what you, you the things you're speaking to policy wise, you're so aligned. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm talking, and I think part of it is that when 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 you look at the political system, you have a conservative party that are incredibly vicious, are incredibly cruel. Right, mm-hmm. once they are in power. Right, they carry out their agenda systematically, devastatingly. They, may, I mean, look at Sheffield. They cut half of our entire council's budget. Right, vicious. Why? Because they didn't think that there would be many votes for them in Sheffield. Simple as. Right. You, you, you can look at the Conservative. You've got, you've got two councillors now. You know that. They are. Yeah, I'm just saying they cut the council's budget by half. Right. <laughs> and, and you, and you, and you look, and you look at the, and you look at the Conservative party when they're in power. They really push the interests of the rich and the powerful. You know, what I mean, look at look what Liz Truss tried to do, right? Tax cuts for the rich in the middle of a crisis, <laughs> in the middle of a crisis. But in a way, the only party that currently is in a position to stop that is the Labour Party. And, and, and do you think right now, as things are, yeah. the Labour Party is a party that is ready to be in government, looking at the fact that mm. you've lost four general elections in a row? I, I, I mean, if there was a general election tomorrow, I would be stunned if the Conservatives leave with that many seats. Right? And the Keir Starmer, you've got I, faith. I, I, th- I think the Labour Party right now would win the next election, right? Because I think that I think what's happened is that people are looking at the Conservative Party, and they're saying, this can't this can't carry on, right? Right. You 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 you, you I mean I mean to think about a Conservative Party that prides itself on the economy and wrecks the economy, that prides itself on. Um, you know, on, 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 on you know, on all sorts of ideas of home ownership and whatever, and yet makes more. It's incredible, right? It's mm-hmm. like we're watching, we're watching. It almost feels like you're watching the death of the conservative. Okay, party. so I'm going yeah, to sorry, come yeah, back yeah. hard on you because okay. you're trying to avoid this. I know. Under Keir Starmer, that. Yeah. So when you, if should you make it as the chosen candidate yeah. for Sheffield Central, yeah, you are going to be standing up for Keir Starmer. What's your confidence in him? I think you look at the poll ratings right now, right? Keir Starmer isn't just, you know, Keir Starmer is the leader of the Labour Party and the Labour Party is doing fantastically at the moment, right? So at the moment, like, the confidence levels is, it is really high, right? Like, Labour are going to win the next election the way it's looking, but you should never... If it was, if it was, if there was an election called right now, we expect that that's what, that's what polls are suggesting. That's what polls yeah. are suggesting. And I was about to say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't count your... Yeah. Chickens before they've hatched, right? <laughs> you should be careful. You should be humble. Keep, keep, keep doing the work. Mm-hmm. But I think the Labour Party at the moment is is successfully making the argument that the Conservative Party cannot be allowed to stay in power. That they're they're really like now an incredibly damaging force, right? And I think that's part of the part of what's happening right now is that we're watching an incredibly damaging government that really was planning on raiding like the national wealth as well. That they were planning mm-hmm. on just borrowing money to give it out to the wealthy. 
Mm. And that would have left the debt, but they don't care, right? Mm. And I think that's what's in. So I think I think I'm I'm I, I'm really looking forward to a Labour government. Mm. Um, I do you know I'd love to be an MP in the Labour government. Right, I'm looking forward to a general election soon. Okay. I just want us to come back into the campaign that you launched yeah. recently. Um, I was looking on Twitter. Yeah, you've had loads of support. Yeah, but also you've had some people sending you some messages that yeah. are really unpalatable. Yeah. Well, How yeah. have you been? coping with those mm. messages and are you surprised the attack, the, especially some of the racist attacks that are telling you to go home yeah. and that kind of thing? I mean, I, I don't think there's anyone who is, um, I don't think there's anyone who is from a, a black background or a you know, background of colour that is surprised that there are racists on Twitter who love the anonymity mm -hmm. and finally get to say what they're thinking, right? Yeah. And uh, I think we have to remember what the point of racism is. Right, part of the heart of racism is about is about destroying your sense of self confidence, your sense of self esteem, right, and making you feel weak and powerless, and accepting of someone else's uh, domination over your well being, right. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore it's always important to not allow them to have that victory, right, because that's, that's part of the purpose is to really degrade you to damage. And if you think about it, right. It reminds you of what the heart of the messages that came out in the civil rights movement later on in the, in the post yeah. immediate civil rights movement, which mm -hmm. really was about trying to get people, and even really trying to get people to think in terms of being proud of who they are, because that was a necessary part of the equation for civil rights, mm -hmm. right? How do you how do you make demands when you feel weak, right? Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. So the but looking at the fact yeah. that we are in the twenty first century, yeah. Britain, yeah, what would you? I don't know how to put it, but yeah. one would like to think that we've gone past this, yeah. but yet it is still happening. And it, some of those messages, when I read them, yeah. they were really, really distressing. Mm. But are you saying that is making you even more stronger to aspire what you're aspiring for? Oh, absolutely. Like, what those, the thing that those people would hate the most, right, is um, if people like me win, right? That's what they would hate the most, right? Mm. Because, like, the whole point is, why, who, who wakes up in the morning, sees a message about someone who's running for an election in their home area, and then decides to start writing messages, right? Who, what kind of person does that? It's a person who is desperate to, desperate for you to fail. Right. Desperate to get a reaction. Desperate for you to be, to feel worse because of them, right? Hmm. And in so far as we can, I'm not going to give the wrong advice by telling people you should always just be like, you know, be a wall and take on, no, no, you shouldn't. But I'm saying... In so far as you can, let it be the wind behind you, right? Mm -hmm. Let it be the fuel that keeps you going, right? Knowing that those sorts of people out there, they're hoping for your failure, is a reason for you to be ever more determined to be successful, right? And successful, not for the sake of success, but successful because there is a cause that you're working towards, right? Yeah. And that cause has to be, if you look at the end of the video, that cause has to be something deeply, deeply human. It has to be about making sure that there's no kids there are yeah. no kids <laughs> at food banks, right? Yeah. It has to be. Oh, they about. shouldn't be food banks, they to be fair. We should not be having food banks in 2022. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. That there shouldn't be, that there shouldn't be anybody who has to, you know, I, I don't want to go through my video, but like, you know, eating and eating. Like, you, you don't, we shouldn't ever be in a position, right, where people are feeling these things. But our point is that we keep being motivated on behalf of each other. Yeah. Oh. Do, do you feel like there's a need for you to combat that on the campaign trail or what do you do when you're faced with that in real time, real life, mm. you're going to be experiencing that on social media, it's one thing, but yeah. in real life, how do you deal with that? What do you think? What's your strategy? I mean, it's, 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 it's an interesting one. I, I, there's, I don't know if there's a completely right answer, right? Mm. Sometimes you challenge, sometimes yeah. you, you ignore. It, it's a question of who you're dealing with, the context, what they're seeking, right? But by and large, listen, I, I, you made a really good point, right? Mm. It's the 21st century, right? Mm. It's Britain, right? Mm -hmm. Why are we even having to have a conversation about whether or not uh, someone could be a black politician, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that, that person should be subjected to attacks. And I have to say, part of it is that if we allow, you know, the more of these attacks we allow, right? The more that these things aren't kind of, uh, you know, aren't kind of, uh, you know, not only just prevented, but kind of educated out of the way that people see people, mm -hmm. The more that we're accepting of it, right? And I think that's a kind of a danger, dangerous place to find ourselves to be accepting racism. But I, I to me, to be honest, like I said, for me, I use it as a fuel to keep going, 
right? Right. Okay. And an energy. I, I'm just gonna ask you this question. I know when, if you are to win, yeah, you'll be standing or you'll be representing Sheffield Central. Yeah. And anyone connected to Sheffield Central or anyone who lives in Sheffield Central. But I'm just thinking, yeah. being we are in Black History Month, I just thought to ask you this question. Black people are underrepresented in Parliament and in Sheffield, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you'll be the first black person if you are to win, mm. you know, the first black African. Mm. What will your role bring to black people in Sheffield or to Africans? Of, uh, you know, of African heritage. I, I, you know, I, I'll go back to what I said, which is I hope that what it does is that it gets rid of someone's doubts who's right now saying, I don't think I can do politics. Right. right? I hope it gets rid of someone's doubts who's right now thinking to themselves, I can't handle it, I'm not sure, am I good enough? You know, these, these kind of doubtful questions, mm. these questions of anxiety, these questions of uncertainty, I hope that it dispels someone's. Right, mm. and I hope that what it does is that that someone comes into politics, mm -hmm. right, and does consider me more good than I ever did, right? Because that's always the hope, right? Like that you do better and you inspire. That the next better, person, that the yeah. next person is always better. Builds on. That the next person, yeah, exactly, builds on, is better, and keeps going. Yeah. So that's in a way that's you know you say the the first MP of African descent, the first Black MP in in South Yorkshire or in in Sheffield. I think well, would that not I didn't want South to say South Yorkshire. No, I didn't say Yorkshire. I'm not sorry, Shay. I, 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 yeah, I may have stumbled on my yeah. words. Do you know? Is it South Yorkshire? Well, I was in show, but sure. Sheffield is going to his. If he is Sheffield to win. would be, yeah. yeah. But I just, well, I doubt. Might just don't be. get me wrong. If he didn't happen in Sheffield, I'm wrong as well. No. Yeah, no, don't worry, Abdi. We didn't quote you there. You were very clear. You don't know, yeah. But I think, yeah, but I think, you know, at the heart of it is kind of, you know, in a way, what, 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 when I look at the job of an MP, there's mm -hmm. two halves to it, right? One half of it is the local. Mm -hmm. And that half is really about the idea that the people of that area are represented, right? And I personally think the best way you do that is by having someone from that area, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, that's, I, I think it makes sense, right? That someone yeah. who has deep roots in that area should be the person that represents it's that area. It's significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the second half is that that person gets involved in national politics. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the other element of the MP. And for that, listen, I have the practical kind of expertise, mm -hmm. but actually also I have a sense of the kinds of things that I think are incredibly important. Because, okay. you know, because I think people talk about policy, and that's something I do too, mm -hmm. but actually there's a step above policy, which is what's the point of policy, right? So I, I always think this when I think about the I always think about this when I think about the NHS, right? Uh -huh. so, so what can you say to critics? Oh who talk about experience. Yeah. Like, uh, if you look at most of the time, mm. those that aspire to become MPs, yeah. they come from the local level by yeah. being counsellors, mm. by climbing the ladder. Yeah. What, what can you say to those who are kind of sceptical, who think you mm. lack the experience, mm. yes, you've got the energy, yeah. you've got the aspiration, yeah. but you still lack that experience? Yeah. I mean, in a way, the thing I would say is actually, I have an incredible amount of experience because the job I'm applying for is Parliament. And the mm -hmm. job I work in is Parliament, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's it's the perfect fit, right? You know, the reason I'm frustrated is because I see it with my own eyes, right? The reason I'm frustrated is because I see the political system deeply dysfunctional, and sometimes you do see politicians not doing the right thing, not saying the right thing, mm -hmm. and you go, I'm 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 going to pull out my hair, right? And at some point, you go, you know what? I want to be the MP, <laughs> right? Or I want to be an MP, right? Yeah. And I think that's kind of the sense that that happens is that. Actually, I would say that the, the in a way, I, I have probably the best, you know, I have a really good fit in terms of, you know, obviously I don't know who all the other people are, but like, I have a very good fit when it comes to the expertise, because the expertise is in Parliament, and the expertise about parliamentary process, parliamentary systems, how you get things done, how the political system is set up, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think for those things, in terms of coming back with influence for Sheffield, mm -hmm. because that's the thing, there will hopefully be a Labour government, which means that actually the question of the MP is not only what you're doing in national politics, but what are you bringing back in terms of influence for your city, for your region, for your constituency, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that is much easier if the parliamentary system is something that you have got years of experience already. So I, I would say on the experience level, I, 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 I'm very comfortable. So, so for the benefit of our listeners right now, yeah. what's the process? Like we mentioned earlier, it's still early. Yeah. But from my understanding, you know, you go through stages. Yes. And can you just clarify those stages? If you uh, so applications closed 
earlier today. Mm-hmm. Um, the there will be a week, and then next Friday is long listing, mm-hmm. where a panel of the regional Labour Party will come together and will decide who's long listed. Mm-hmm. The individual long listed will then be able to go to the local wards. Right. So there's five wards, okay. and ask those wards to nominate them. Mm-hmm. The, the wards will be able to nominate two candidates, mm-hmm. and then off the back of that, and I think other things. The, How many nominations does each candidate need to get? Um, the the the, oh, the, the, the panel will decide. So uh, there's no okay. there's no set rule. I think that that what will happen is in the panel of the local party, mm-hmm. the CLP will come together and they will pick who they're shortlisting, mm-hmm. uh, and they'll use you know different things, including. Um, what happened at the selection meetings okay. or what happened at the um, the meetings in the wards and then from there um, what happens is those are the shortlisted candidates and those shortlisted candidates mm-hmm. will be given access to the membership data so for the first time they'll be able to know who are the members in Sheffield okay. Central yeah. All right. mm-hmm. and finally now they know who the members are they'll be allowed to contact them so, so basically it's only gonna be Sheffield Central Labour members that will be voting, or is it going to be the entire Sheffield? Only Sheffield Central Labour members, and only those who have been members for six months. Six Five months. Years. How long have you been a member of the Labour Party, Abdi? Since 2010. Since 2010? Jeremy wow. Corbyn time? Yeah. No, no. Well, for, I, I, well actually joined, I actually joined during 2010 during um, Clegmania. Ah, yeah, that cool. time. So, because so, I, mm. do you know what? I, I, I don't want to say I, I saw the future, but I, I did the time because I was because I was involved in student stuff. I, I was very, very concerned about the Lib Dems not living up to their promise because they promised to get rid of tuition fees, mm. Mm. and we were so excited. Yeah. And I think a lot. I remember so many students. Were, uh, and for the I'm record, at the Dems. time, uh, Nick Clegg was Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam. Hallam, so yeah. Sheffield Hallam. So, so a bit of familiarity there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Sheffield Hallam, and it was like national. There was national Clegg mania, but especially in, in, she- in Sheffield. Especially in Sheffield. Yeah. And I remember there were lots of people who were like. And I remember lots of students, right? And I'd be like, oh, you know, vote Labour. And they'd be like, no, 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 the Lib Dems are getting rid of fees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm, I remember it was such that, a yeah. It was such a potent promise. They put it on a pledge. They made it, and, and because of that, I just remember like this tidal wave of just like oh students God, who were all yeah. kind of like voting Lib Dem, voting Lib Dem, voting Lib Dem. I was a student then as well. <laughs> Were you really? Really? Wow. Well, I feel I feel I feel as old as I am, which is good. Yeah. Ah, but you I, see, I this this well. takes me back to the David Miliband, Ed Miliband, Ed Miliband days. Miliband, yeah. But that, that whole it it's, was an it's interesting, so interesting period, yeah. wasn't it? Exactly. It was an interesting yeah. period. Yeah. yeah. And so I went and joined Labour at that time. So let's let, let's move forward to yeah. we go through all these stages that you and Bailo have just been talking about, yeah. and there, ta da, Abdi is the candidate. Who are we likely to see in your team? In my team? Yeah, who is going to be your campaign manager? Who are, I mean, you've been thinking of all these things, so we don't want to be surprised. Tell us now. Who who, who have you got? Who's your mentor? Who are you working with? I, but I, do you mean in terms of the election? In, in the ele- Yeah, so now you're, you're the candidate. Who is working with you? Uh, any, any people that we've heard of before that have worked on previous campaigns with other... Uh, members of Parliament. I'm Is she sure. clear enough? I was gonna. I was gonna say. I was gonna say. I, I, was, I, I just gonna, wanted to get I, I closer. Should, to yeah, that. I'm, I'm just. I should probably, probably have, have no permission from anyone to mention the name. So that's the only. Uh, have you been uh, talking to people? No, uh, no. Obviously, there's. To be honest, what's interesting is lots of people that okay. um, campaigned with me all the way back when I was running for president of the SU in okay. in in 2011, 12, mm-hmm. and then I became president 12, 13. So it's kind of incredible sometimes, like some of the friends you make. Let, let, let's do this. Let's do this, Bailo, right? Okay, so okay. he says lots of people campaign for me when I was students. So mm-hmm. we're thinking youngish, youngish sort of people. Uh, student. I'm talking about, now I'm talking about this life beyond the student okay. life. Who are we working with? Anyone? I Anyone hate. that we know in particular? <laughs> no, I'm, 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 Someone I'm, who's worked for somebody else? Is that it? I'm, 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 I've got, I've got, I'm not too sure. I've got no, no permission to talk about anyone. So I, I'm... They completely 100% dodge that question. So we caught you off guard there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Successfully. <laughs> right, so okay, let's put it this way. Yeah. Uh, we are in Black History Month. Yeah. Who would you say is your role model? I, you know, I reference Frederick Douglass in my Saw so that on your video. website, yeah. I, because I, I, I love Frederick Douglass. And I mm. love the story of Frederick Douglass. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and if you ever listen to any, if you ever read any of his speeches, mm. there's some of the most beautiful rhetoric you'll ever see. And the sad thing is that um, 
even in his speeches, he talks about how he doesn't need rhetoric. Rhetoric is not what he's asking for. He's asking for actions, right? He, he wants people's, um, their feelings to be woken. He wants them to be energetic. He wants them to do things, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think Frederick Douglass is an incredible person. I think someone that everyone should uh, find out a lot more about. And, and, and he, has, he has a British connection as well, because when he... I was just going to say, like, what's with black British politicians always citing American politicians? Has, so has, now tell me he that. He has a British connection. So when Frederick Douglass, Douglass uh, and I, uh, forgive me any historian who's listening if I get this wrong, when he escaped... Uh, uh, he uh, he actually went to Ireland, mm -hmm. and so actually you can go to Ireland. There's murals of of, of Frederick Douglass there. So not and Northern Ireland. It's Ireland. I guess. You know, yeah, I, it's yeah. a good question. Actually. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure where in Ireland. Because we've got Southern Ireland, and we've got Northern Ireland. But wait, it's, it's Ireland. Ireland. Okay. It's, it's we'll take that. It's a genuine question. I'm actually not we'll 100 percent sure where in Ireland he went. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, he he, uh, if the story is correct, people fundraised for him to be able to right. um, get his freedom. But he went back and he was really one of the great orators and what was incredible is you know it's a bit like the conversation we were having earlier mm -hmm. white america was so utterly convinced of the inferiority of the slaves yeah that they couldn't imagine that they could really speak right mm -hmm. and so in frederick douglas was someone that was incredibly articulate incredibly intelligent incredibly sharp in his critiques right mm -hmm. and people almost couldn't imagine like, even when his book was published about his life, people were like, no, no, no slave could have written this, right? Mm. And it's this, it's, this, it's this ridiculous, like, kind of idea, but it can show you how deep the racism can get. But, but I mean, it, Frederick Douglass, I think, is incredible. And that's, all, that's kind of my, my answer is, I, yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. On. Uh, I'm going to tap into a, a bit of a, a very stereotypical, but something that excites me about people with Somali heritage. Um, because you're talking about Frederick Douglass and you're speaking about him as a narrator. And um, for me, culturally, I really love the poetry that comes out of Somali mm. heritage community. Yeah. Do you think there's something about a narrator and, and that power? Yeah. I think culturally, Somalis mm. do tend to do a lot of poetry. Is that something the, that, that, that you recognize in the two? Yeah, no, I, rec I recognize it a lot. I, I remember once being told that, you know, in the old Somali tradition, it was better to have... A great poet in your tribe than to have a great warrior wow. because a, a warrior could, could kill a person mm -hmm. but a poet could uh, you know almost defeat an entire you know uh, I mean, it's awful because it's all about tribes and that but it's you know could, could, you, it's could, could yeah, humiliate it's another tribe or could write a beautiful poem ex extolling their tribe right mm -hmm. and th listen the tribalism bit isn't good but the poetry is it's beautiful powerful. and actually that acknowledgement and that centrality of language mm -hmm. in Somali culture is incredible and I you know it's it's one of those things where I think people often get this when they speak another language uh, but sometimes they hear phrases in another language like that's so beautiful I just can't phrase it the right the same way in English or something yeah and I think that I, whenever when I when I when I when I hear people speak Somali when they're some of the phrases some of the some of the way some of the tonalities they're just incredible and just the, the sharpness the wit the funniness like I think there's um some of it comes from that valuing of language and also from the fact that for a long for long periods of Somali history um S somali did not write we passed i mean i think it's, a, it's across the african exactly. continent we, we, we would pass on knowledge or exactly. yeah exactly yeah. And, and therefore it compelled people both to have i guess very good memories but mm -hmm. also to be very good when it came to language and i think that it's still the same today where um at, at least you know in the somali community it's very valued to be able to be able to speak incredibly well um, and it's and if you're a poet, well, ten times better. Mm. And I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, the Somali community, mm. uh, have you kind of like spoke to the elders to tell them your 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 Ambitions. your ambition? The, the, you know what, and what? And what has been their response so far? One thing that's been incredible is the is the excitement, okay. and the engagement, and they've been incredibly helpful, incredibly encouraging. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, there's a lot of debt owed to them because. In a way that they they will have struggled through much more difficult circumstances than us in some ways, to, in order to give us the circumstances that we have. So um, a lot of excitement, um, but I think in the end it's interesting because you can have you know, it's so interesting that there's you know you can have all this excitement, um, but often like the membership, uh, you know, mm -hmm. of, of the of the Labour Party, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think this is you know this is not not a, not a secret that there's not as many young people. As, as as you would want, there's yeah. you know, and actually, there's probably not as many people from 
uh, uh, minority, minority communities as you'd want. And I think that's kind of sad because we, a lot of, you know, if you look at the numbers, mm -hmm. minority communities disproportionately vote for the Labour Party, right? Yeah. And therefore, in a way, if you're constantly voting for the Labour Party, then you should be involved in the Labour Party as well, so you can decide. You should which... be in decision making. Okay. So now you've got to decide uh, yeah. which way. You've got less than okay. five minutes. So okay. talk to the people. Like okay. you said here, loads of minorities do vote for Labour. Yeah. What do you think? Talk to them. Yeah. Convince them to join the Labour Party. You've got Convince five minutes. Five minutes. Day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> five, 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 five minutes to join the Labour Party. Um, no. I, 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 or would... why the Labour Party? <laughs> no. I, 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 you know, you, you should always, you, you know, very honest about this. I think people should do should make the decision that that's right for them, right? But the reason I have made the decision for the Labour Party is that I think that if you're looking for a party whose history is about the idea of working people, people who just day to day people taking power and being able to decide what happens in their lives, yeah. then that's the Labour Party. If you want a party that historically has been so associated with anti racism, and the trade unions themselves have fought incredibly hard against racism, right? Uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, this, you know, I remember when I used to go on anti-racism demonstrations mm -hmm. and, you know, it's always helpful to have a, a good bunch of trade unions come along with you, right? That's debatable, though, apart from if you didn't watch the recent labor fires. I haven't watched them. I haven't watched them. So <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Safe I, bet. Yeah, I know. I haven't watched them. I, yeah, as yeah. you're getting towards that, like, 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 tell everybody how they can find information like, about you. It's, like, it's, like being, it's like being, it's like being, it's like being, it's like being, I didn't see it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't see it, right? I don't know much about football, but I got that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> right. Um, so where, 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 are, where are people going to, like, where, where do people see where you're taking this campaign? I would, where, where's your presence? I'll, 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 be, I'll, be, I'll almost do it as a quick pitch. Uh, if, you, if you go on the, uh, on the Twitter page, and uh, it's Abdi underscore chef, S-H-F, you'll find a link to the website. Now, on the website, you can join. Now, what we say is we're very clear. We say everyone's invited, right? Mm -hmm. We want everyone in this campaign because we want this to be a proper community-led campaign. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to bring their energies, whatever type of energy they want to bring, right? Because mm -hmm. different people are good at different things. I don't, want, you know, I don't want this to be the sort of campaign where people are told, you have to go do this thing, right? I actually think the amazing thing is when people bring the things they're interested in, in their whether it's their hobbies or the things they do at work, mm -hmm. that they're good at, they bring it to a campaign, you build an incredible campaign. And that kind of campaign is completely unstoppable. So I think that a campaign built in Sheffield Central, right, with people volunteering, getting involved, and people from outside Sheffield Central, if they know people in Sheffield Central, and that sort of campaign is completely unstoppable and incredibly enthusing. And I just hope that off the back of this, there's a whole bunch of people who take a new view of themselves and go, wait a minute, I'm going to go become a politician. And frankly, I'm going to go become someone who uses power for good, because we need as many of those people as possible. Definitely we do. Do you have a final word from you? Ah, yeah, no. Uh, so, Abdi, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you well as you run up into being possibly the candidate. Uh, we, we will get to see who else is aspiring. But we definitely wish you well. And personally, I would really like to see more people of African descent being in decision-making uh, uh, positions especially at national level um, and I hope that if you do get there you will be an implementer not just a talker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much Abdi and Chiwe yourself. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and guess what you are our first live guest since okay. the COVID pandemic. We pre-recorded so, everything. <laughs> you know, Thank you. So really really you've been uh, it's been a pleasure having you and to all our listeners, uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is African Voices Platform. Until next week.